This is Alexandre Franqui, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. Hey, man, I appreciate you coming on. I'm fascinated by this movie that you created. Uh, so just for the audience in general, I'm going to put the links up here in the show so you can check it out. But you made a movie called Happy Face. Please tell us about it. Well, I'm glad to be here, Pete, and uh, glad you liked it. So, oh, my God, Happy Face. Um, Happy Face is a story of Stan, a 19-year-old teenager, I guess, who can't cope with his mom's illness and the effect it has on her face. And uh, so he, he deforms his face with bandages and he hides in a workshop for disfigured people to, as a form of therapy, as a form of self-therapy, misguided therapy, and he gets discovered. And then the whole question is like, what the hell is he doing there? Uh, and, and complications ensue. And complications ensue. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Uh, who wrote this movie? Uh, we co-wrote it with my, my co-writer and partner, OERs here, uh, Joel Bourjoli and, and myself. We co-wrote it. And it was based on, on uh, an autobiographical episode of when I was a teenager and my mom was sick. I got you. And then you, you got actors who have, I don't know, what's the proper way to say this? They have uh, malformed faces? What, what, what's the respectful way to say it? The, the, the politically correct term is facial differences, or okay. some people say disfigurement. Right, right. Okay, so, so you have folks that have unique faces, yeah. and, and uh, you, you purposely brought them in because you didn't want to do, well, I mean, like, why would you make that decision? Are, you, are there a lot of actors that, are, uh, that have the disfigurement thing or the malformed thing? Uh, well... First of all, I always say, oh, makeup was too expensive, and that, that's a big joke. Uh, I think morally, morally, it was kind of impossible for me to take, quote, unquote, normal act looking people, I mean, faces without blemishes, and, and put makeup on. I think the idea is I wanted to have the real, the real McCoy, basically. And uh, I mean, it's like, you know, not doing blackface, it's obvious. Well, in this case, for me, it was obvious not to put makeup on actors to pretend to be somebody else. Although acting is about that. So I, I wanted to search for people who had uh, a facial difference. And there were some performers, uh, some people who had experience performing, whether it was through music, through acting, through public speaking, and others that had no acting background, no acting experience. And one of these performers is E.R. Roos, who wrote the song of the film. Yeah, I love that song. Uh, ER, I was just listening to the uh, trailer because I love that song that you created. You're in the movie. Uh, when did you get involved in this project and what was that like? Uh, it was very... Uh, first off, can you hear me correctly? Yes, um, we can hear you. Because I was getting yeah. a little... Okay, cool. Uh, you know, it w I got into the process when I think Alex had someone cast it. And uh, he was uh, unable to, to follow through, and I think he had to drop out. And um, and um, and then I and when I auditioned, I didn't. I think I did it one way, and then Alex was like, "Do it another way, or be you, be myself." And and then I got a chance to freestyle in front of him while we while I was auditioning, and uh, and it was just a really cool cool process because it was uh, unorthodox in a way. It, it, uh, it, where it, it kind of made me more open and uh, suggestive to uh, to the ideas and um, and sharing my and sharing my my feelings and how I felt about uh, my scars, you know. So it was definitely uh, it was a it was pretty pretty cool, but then at the same time a little a little strange and weird. At <laughs> yeah, when yeah, when I remember Alex that. Come I remember, Go ahead. I, I remember that audition. Uh, just a little parenthesis. It's true. I, I, we were casting and we were trying to find, we couldn't find people in Montreal. So we looked at New York, LA, all over. And ER was auditioning. They brought him in and I had already found another guy in Montreal. So closer to where I'm living in Canada to shoot, who was supposed to make the role and I guess fit better what we had written. And I remember ER did his audition, and ER, you played the tough guy because you played tough guys in movies, and uh, all the time, yeah. I know, and it was it was the tropes we see in you know in North American films, right? And but then when he was speaking to me, like now I found this soft spoken guy, very mellow, very chill, and I was like, wait a minute, that's like, okay, no, I like that, 
and then and then he freestyle. I asked him to freestyle on the theme of, of beauty and appearance and himself, and, and it was just great. So I was like, okay, okay, we're, we're gonna find a way to put you in the movie, you know, even if it's a small part. And then the other guy dropped out, and it was like, okay, so it's gonna be a big part. <laughs> it's gonna be like, a big part, you know. So I mean, it was great. I mean, I'm glad. Like we became friends, and then in the middle of the film, like in the middle of the rehearsal and, and, and we're doing like fittings, I was like, oh man, maybe we sh you should do a song for this. You should rap on the characters. And he was in, he was in my apartment in Montreal and I was checking locations yeah. and photos and he, was, he went into the other room, I remember, and he was like writing it up. He took a nap, he wrote another verse and then he kind of read it. And I have yeah, that tape, yeah. I have the iPhone yeah. tape of that. And, and Whoa. It, was like, <laughs> it was the song and we were shooting the film and at late at night when we finished at 11, I have friends who have a, a studio, you know, sound studio, uh, who wanted to help out for free. And we go there, we get some burgers, you know, smoke a joint and go there and then he would do his thing. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have to wake up at five to go shoot the next day. So we built a song like that. I mean, he built the song and uh, it was great. Yeah, it, it's catchy. No, but we, it's, yeah, go ahead, man. Thanks, thanks. Oh, I was saying we built it because like, I like I, uh, you know, the whole idea was 90s. So I was listening to like 90s hip hop and uh, Rakim specifically. And yeah. um, and uh, and then when we got into the studio, uh, I think I was I was rapping in one way. And then and then Alex was like, um, you were like directing me. <laughs> I was being booth. my producer. I was being a hip hop producer. <laughs> 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 yeah, he was like, "No, bring that funk. Just you know, bring something different. You know, what are you feeling? You know, and I, and I, and it came out that way. It was really cool. It was a fun experience to be able to like create something that wasn't even really a part of it, and it was just kind of improvised on the spot in that moment during filming. Yeah, yeah, those are some of the best, so, the yeah, best was, times. And I, I could hear the '90s influence. I, I liked it. Like. There's a certain busyness to the background of that 90s rap, and, and you you nailed that down. I wanted to ask you, Alex, you, you've you've done other you've done shorts, and then it looks like you've done another feature, but you take a good bit of time between these projects. Uh, what are you doing or, or what's the why do you have the long gaps and, and then are you looking at picking up the pace in terms of features? That's a good point, and it hurts that you bring it up, Pete. Uh, <laughs> because it 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 it, it goes, it, you know, hits my insecurities, and and you know, and you know, aging, and and, and not being able to do one's art. Um, yeah, I mean, my first feature film, The Wild Hunt, was really an ordeal to make financially and emotionally, and then after that, I feel sick. I got hit with cancer myself, and. Uh, and that put me out for a number of years. And then I, I, I you know, I I'm, I'm make a living directing TV commercials. So I worked hard to basically, you know, make money to pay you right. know, the debts and everything and get my life back in order. And so um, it took me a while. Uh, I mean, financially, mechanically, if you will, also mentally to get back on track. But also I think what took a while was that happy face because it's such a story that dealt with my mom's, own battle with cancer when I was a teenager and my relationship with her, it was kind of like, um, I was so close to it that I did not have perspective. And so the screenplay went through years and years of development. And thank God, Joel Bourjoli, my co-writer was there to, to keep the faith and <laughs> keep encouraging me and keep the focus. And, and so I think it took a long time because of that, because the subject was too personal. I wanted to give it justice and I didn't want to screw it up. And, and I, I ended up like second guessing myself for a long time. And yeah. When you so look I, I do want to pick up the pace. Sorry. I do want yeah. to pick up the pace. I'm picking no, up the pace right now. <laughs> but, but I mean, life, life happens, right? Like right now we've got a global pandemic. There's directors all over the place that would love to pick up the pace, but sometimes you can't cancer comes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why I asked the questions because you can see that you're getting work it's just you know there's these gaps between your features and then when, when you decide to come out and do this you know I, lo I know a lot of directors who do something else in the directing discipline to pay the bills that's not what they want to do but it's what they do to, to be able to do this and then so every now and then if the timing works out you get to take your shot and do a feature film but happy face seems like such a a, a challenging decision to make it seems like an artistic decision not a challenging decision when you make this decision about Happy Face to tell this story inspired by your mom's life, 
are you like, this is a gamble. This might be hard to sell. Or are you like, I don't give a damn about that. This is an important story. How do you think through that process? Because you could just go make, you know, a, a rom-com and be like, here you go, Lifetime movies, you know, like done. Why yeah. this movie? It seems challenging. That's a very astute point, Pete, because I remember having a conversation with my agent in LA and he said, look, he understood. He goes, you're making this movie because it's a personal movie. It was more not even artistic. It was like a visceral, cathartic, you know, linked to my psychological well-being. That's the reason I went into cinema is when my mom died, when she was sick. I took an art course as a means to escape and I fell in love with it. So it was, and he said, you know, he says, unless it's a real, you know, like a super duper home run, it's a movie about cancer, disfigurement, like it's going to be a hard sell. And And he was right. And I knew that, but sometimes when you're a filmmaker, particularly in, in countries where the state funds cinema, like Canada, France, Europe, you kind of tend to forget the market because okay. you know that they could finance your own personal navel gazing film, which is what Happy Face is in a way. Uh, I don't want to shoot it down, but I mean, that's what it was. It was something I did for myself first. And then it became something else as I met the actors. Um, so no, it was, um, I'm certainly paying the price for it career wise because it was not a commercial endeavor, but on a personal level, it changed my life. On the human interacting, you know, interacting with others level, it changed my life. It got me to, well, meet meet the cast. Uh, it got me to become less superficial with other people. It got me to teach at-risk youth, teach indigenous youth in remote communities about beauty, appearance, bullying. Got me to do some talks, uh, apply for some research projects in the university. Like, it really opened up, like, a different thing sphere of life where I, you have these social workers who call me up and say, oh, do you want to come and talk to our kids? Because we like your style. You're kind of brutally honest. And it's kind of like, yeah. you know, no taboos. And and so humanly, it opened a lot mm -hmm. of doors. Commercially, no. No, I'm working on the commercial parts now. Now I'm gearing up for some genre films and some badass stuff that's going to hit the mark. Aren't we all working on <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> ER in there. Hey, ER, I want to ask you, and I want to be, uh, you know, I want to be respectful, but when you have, um, you know, you've got burn scars on your face. I don't know if everybody can see that because of uh, the camera and the internet and everything, but when you have this look, you're going to be typecast, like you said, as bad guys and that kind of thing. How does that, does that in fact impact your soul where, you know, you're never going to get a Brad Pitt role because Brad Pitt looks like Brad Pitt and you look like you know, someone who's going to be an enforcer or someone scary, does that, or, or maybe I'm putting that on you. Maybe you're like, I'm going to be a leading man. I don't know. Except, but talk to me about how you sort that out in the industry, because you definitely can make money all the time. You know, like I, I can see you getting hired just because of your, your look. Yeah, man. Um, well, I mean, that's how I kind of get to it. Is look. And to a lot of people that I've met in the young dark podcast, but I figured, um, we have, um, first and foremost, like, I'm happy being here, period. Like, I'm comfortable in my skin. It doesn't bother me if people see me. Uh, uh, and um, so, yo, like, I just said, if people want to cast me the guy. The best hey, damn bad ER, guy. ER, I'm going to jump in here. Yeah, um, your signal is bad. I'm oh. going to kick you out of the studio. Will you come back in and hopefully it'll connect better because we, we can't understand you. Okay, just come right back in. Oh, try to. Okay. Yeah, try it again. I'm going to kick uh, you out. Come right back. All right. Okay. While he does that, Franchi, talk yeah. about that that basic question for ER. <clears throat> What is it like for an actor or some or director who's like, I need someone who's terrifying? In this case, you're trying to not lean on makeup. Is that how did you deal with that as a director when you're trying to? I mean, I, I want to be respectful when I talk to ER or someone else who's got some kind of disfigurement. I, you know, I don't want to draw attention to it, but when it's on your face, it is, it is right there. How do you deal with that? And and how do you care for the well-being of the actors on this movie? I mean, okay, yeah. Uh, for sure, you gotta have when you're a director with actors, you, you know, disfigured or facially different or not, you have to have a level of trust and you have to have no taboos and be able to talk about everything. 
and not have ego. So in this case, it was a film about that, about the face. So we, you know, I did, um, I did a lot of explaining what my situation was, what my relationship with my mom and her illness and her the, her, the loss of her beauty, how, how ashamed I was, how it affected me. I kind of opened up a lot about my life story and encouraged them to do the same. And we did a lot of workshops where we talked about that and we did acting exercises where we actually practiced insulting each other or we practiced writing down everything that people have said in our lives that was mean, for instance, and then reading it out to another person as if, you know, I write down all the insults somebody has told me and I read them out to you and bellow them out to you so that you feel the brunt of what I've endured mm. and vice versa. So we did a lot of that for two, three, four days. And after those days, man, there was no, there was no taboo. We, 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 we could speak about anything. And, and I remember David Roche, uh, uh, the older guy who plays Otis, the older fellow who plays right. Otis, I was talking to him at one point. He was he was my confidant, and um, I was telling him, you know, I, I was having trouble getting funding for this film because people were telling me funding organizations were like, "Well, you're a good-looking guy. You're an average-looking guy. I mean, you're not you're not disfigured. You're you're going to be exploiting those people. You're like you're not representing those people. There's a kind of exploitation." Right. And I was like, "Okay." And I told that to the actors, and they were like, "Well, dude, exploit us. Exploit away. <laughs> we just want to be in the movie." <laughs> and I was like, all right. So so we got past that. Okay. But my crew did not go through that process of rehearsals. So I remember when we first started shooting, you know, I'd be on the set, we'd be have the big camera, I'd be filming filming David, uh, you know, David Roche, Otis, the old guy with all his veins, and, and his eyes are not aligned. And I'd say, Dave, could you keep your head on this side? Because I can't pull the focus on your eyes because your eyes are like, your face is all wonky, man. Like, I can't, we can't focus. And I remember my, my cinematographer, Claudine Sauvé, who's a very sensitive and talented woman, you know, she pulled me aside. She goes, Alex, how are you talking to them? Like, be careful. You know, you've got to be careful. And I was like, no, but they, they, they don't want to be treated as fragile little right. porcelain objects. They just, that's the idea. It's not, you know, the, because they're different, it doesn't mean they're victims or angels or fragile. They're, they're dicks and idiots and petty, just like you and I. And they're great, too. So yeah, that's and then the crew got used to it, and we started yeah, talking yeah. about that, and, and then we became a family. It just yeah, from the outside looking in, as if I'm the camera person, I you know it's I'm uncomfortable because I don't know that you've done that work to check in with them. Let me check in with ER real quick. ER, you're really heavily backlit. Here I am producing the show here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll get there, and, and ER, if it doesn't work out because of Wi-Fi, we'll work out another episode too. So just if it works, it works. If not, we'll get back to it. I want to ask um, another question of you, Alex. So, as you're dealing with this, yeah, because I'm, uh, you know? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, because I'm, I'm barely you hear? hearing you. You're kind of breaking up on. Are me. you in a mansion, you are? Let me. Uh, <laughs> Did you buy a mansion? I am. I'm in a. I'm in a quarantine bubble. I'm. I'm in a quarantine. Bubble. <laughs> nice. Hold, uh, but the signal is bad. It's bad weather. It's, it's bad. It's bad weather over here. Yeah, I hear you. Here it's not bad. Here it's not bad. Yeah, I want to make it work with ER, but we, it, it's hard to understand. So, All right, I'm, um, I'm going to just. Can you go sit on top of the Wi Fi box? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what, how did you know to approach it with this um, insult focused, insults first approach, I guess you would call it? I mean, Mind you, I didn't throw it at them. I asked them. Of course. Uh, and I had an acting coach with us who had worked with uh, uh, sex workers, homeless people, like people that are non-trained. So we, we kind of like, I mean, it was a mix of reading some articles, talking to acting coaches, and it was a necessity. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't. I was like, I need to find out their experience as much as I can. And I can't walk around eggshells. You can't direct a film walking on eggshells. I mean, that's right. and I, and I, that's not the way I deal with people too, and my friends either. So it's kind of like, no, no, we gotta we gotta break the ice. I gotta, I, you know. And I told them, you know, if I ask a question and I'm off or I sound insensitive, do tell. I'll, I'll readjust. I'll apologize. You know. And right. so, yeah, no, it was. Uh, we just created the bubble to have this kind of discourse because it was a movie about that. 
So the, the script right. was there, you know, I mean, we changed the whole script, but I mean, the script was there. Uh, there were things in the script that they reacted to. There were things in the script that were linked to characters they were playing, but that did not, they did not necessarily represent well. So I was like, okay, well, what, what's your experience with this? And then we rewrote, we wrote it. So it turned out to be pretty seamless. Finding those, the people was harder sometimes when dealing with associations, because you have people protecting them. It's the people that are not facially different that are protective of the term of how we approach it. But once I got this group of actors and non-actors and I felt that they really had a genuine way, a genuine desire to express themselves and to surmount their fears. I was like, all right, so then if you want to go all the way, I'm just going to, we're going to, you know, hold hands and we're going to do it. We're just going to go. And, um, if, if you screw up, it's no big deal. It's, I'm not going to be pissed off at you. We're just going to do it again. We're just going to find another way. There was no... Uh, it, it turned out to be fun, you know? I mean, it turned out to be kind of like... I mean, emotional. People were crying on set. Yeah, the scenes were crying. The crew was crying. The, the camera operator had tears in his eyes. I mean, that was the idea, right? That's the film. But but ultimately, at night, we'd go have drinks, and it was just it was just okay. It was just fun. Yeah, and I want to get back to the emotive part because you do get a bonus in the back end, but but let's spend some time in the in the director's chair as you go through auditions. Okay, I've got this, you know, disfigurement and I'm going to try out for this movie, but I suck. You know, like or it's not what you need or you know, there's something there, but the look is there. Like how do you balance the look and the capacity of the actor? Like I can direct this person, I can get there. Talk about those decisions just because just because you have some kind of of disfigurement on your face or some kind of facial difference doesn't mean that you're going to work for the movie. No, no, no. I mean, I, I must I, I don't want to compliment you too much, Pete, but these are really good questions because I haven't been asked those and, and they're great because I remember going through that because you see people, facially different people in movies, they'll just be like play, so they'll play the, 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 you know, the archetypal disfigured person, the archetypal disabled person. And no, I, I needed to have the magic. What I look for is the magic that okay. some, some of people, like I remember um, Cindy Nicholson who plays Buck, who, who passed away last summer, unfortunately. Um, she plays the, the woman with all the pimples and the warts on her face. She she couldn't she couldn't memorize dialogue, but and she cried all the time because she spoke about her mom, which was her true life story. So we really mirrored the story of her character on her life. And but she had such an interesting face. And when she smiled or when she cried, she lit up the screen and she just had this kind of like 70s rock outfit. <laughs> Right. And that, that's it. You know, her, I was like, okay, it's going to be hard to work with her because she can't memorize lines. But whenever she speaks or she says something, it pops. So, right. you, know, you know, that was the case. Some actors could memorize lines, but like me, I'm not a, I haven't, I don't have three years of training in me. So, you know, it'll, it'll feel stilted. So I knew, okay, we're just going to have to do a lot of rehearsals and kind of improv it and then, and then make it flow in their own words and it'll get there. Uh, other people like ER, ER is a natural. Give him a couple of lines, he'll say them in his own way. They work fine. It's good, you know. Like we don't need to overact or overdo anything. So I just, I guess I had to. And I, and by the way, I love doing this. I love working with people that have different backgrounds, whether it's acting, non-acting, or singers or different performers. Because for me, it's all about the magic. It's all about like their inner. I don't want to say demon or daemon in the Greek sense, their inner genius, yes. their inner kind of like spirit. I, I love to take that and extrapolate it and magnify it. And sometimes it's 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 amazing and sometimes it's monstrous. Like the inner monster, I used to tell uh, David Roche, Otis, we need to bring out the inner monster, dude. And so we used, that used to be our joke on the film. So that's what I love to do. So if I could sense that the person was open and some people are closed off to that, and that's fine. But if I could sense that the person was open to going and fetch that creature, then, yeah, that was cool. You know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the little bits, I didn't watch the whole movie, but the little bits I saw, you know, I saw you you get a real impact from the faces because of not just the dialogue, but just when you look at ER's face, it causes a reaction in you, you know? And, and if you, as a director, know that palette of colors, you can now accentuate that with dialogue, with lighting, with music, whatever it is, and really 
it's like a super powerful way to create emotion and create affect in your movie so that you're just like forced to deal with this emotion that's coming from this person just by their simple presence. Yeah, but there's a caveat to that. Okay. And, and I'm going to chastise you for not having seen the film too long. I mean, not having seen longer of the <laughs> film. But yeah. the caveat is after six or seven, eight minutes, you get used to the damn face. Okay. And so if it's just a face, after a while, it works for a short film or a scene. But like after a while, there's going to be more than that to a movie. So I, I needed to make sure I could find people where I could, where I could have an arc with them. And when you see it, and I do hope he, I do hope to get an email from you when you will. Uh, yeah. No, no, but you'll see. Like for me, it was to make sure with Joel, actually the co-writer, who's really good with structure, was to make sure we got an arc, and, and that they were able to hit those notes, whatever notes, to form an arc of character. Because honestly enough, the experience I've had with audiences is after seven or eight, seven or eight minutes, after one or two workshops, people are like, "Yeah, man, they're used about, they're used to the face." Yeah, and so the, the like the effect you say disappear. It wears off basically. The novelty wears off, or the okay. the, 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 the the horror, quote unquote, or the the unease wears off. And, but, uh, and, and would it be fair to say that you're able to transform those colors on that emotional palette to something that's deeper, richer, more pure? I mean, instead of just being the shock kind of emotion, you're able to then take someone and and make them laugh, make them and you know humanize something that would be a monster otherwise. Um, like I understand the question, given the the way we look at it from from the distance but right. honestly at the time of doing the film no it wasn't that okay. it was just like this is the character and and it was just navigating what felt like good acting and what felt forced and what felt genuine and what felt emotional and and pushing for me i love pushing the grotesque and i don't mean grotesque by saying uh, uh, something ugly or hideous i mean grotesque in the sense of a, psycho, a, a conflict of opposing forces within the person, humor and the sure. tragic, laughing and crying yeah. because something dreadful happens and you find humor in it. And so that source of tension for me was about, it was all about getting that in the characters. And again, going back to because the faces are so unique and this is really kind of like the hook for the movie, it seems like, is how do you work between like the act? I need more acting from you. I need you to be less just you and more this how do you how do you guide people to do that in general but in this case because their faces are so present how do you get that out of them you well look when you train with really really skilled and experienced and talented actors i mean they know what to do and they, they roll on their own and you develop a kind of a shorthand uh you know sometimes when you rehearse they do something and you'll be you'll ask an actress an experienced actress what, what did you just do here? What were you thinking when you did that? So you kind of, as a direct, I mean, that's the way I work. I try to understand what they do, what they're thinking about, just a little bit their process. So when yeah. we're on set and they're doing something, I know what's going on a little bit. And I'm like, ah, you see what you did? You were thinking about this. Well, how about you add that your mom that you were thinking about did this to you? You kind of like, you enter their own little personal narrative and you add lines of code and you add lines of, you, you add nuances and, like you get into their world, you don't say, the, you know, they teach us that in film school. You don't say to an actor louder or more or less. Usually you say that to non-actors. So with the actors of Happy Faces and the non-actors, I did the same thing when we were rehearsing. I was like, okay, well, I was filming them and I would show it to them and I would say, look, that, that felt right to me. What were you thinking? You know, and first of all, I got them to get over the idea that what they were doing was bad. I would say, I'm the judge about that, you know, like so. And, and then... It was trying to get that shorthand with them as well, albeit limited with the time we had and their, the experience of some, but to get a shorthand, I was like, okay, when you did that, you were thinking about your mom. All right, you, you did it. That was a bit too much. So so then I would throw something, I would make them laugh, you know, and and just diffuse it. Well, I was like, uh, or I'd, I'd, I'd tell another actor in some cases, well, how about when she does this, put a hand on her shoulder, you know, and then he would do that. And then the person would like, all of a sudden, like become all emotional and react to it. So you. You kind of use different tricks, you know, external tricks, like put a hand on the shoulder or imagine that I'm naked or I would take my shirt off and I would say something stupid so they would crack up. So you use like silly external tricks and then you use more sophisticated techniques like with uh, skilled actors where you get into their narratives and you kind of like refine it with them.
it's basically the same thing, you know, non-actor is a non-actor, you know, and, and a, a trained actor is a trained actor. So you just have to use different little tools to, to, to play with that. The trick is with happy faces, we had the range. We had like non-actors, experienced, uh, no quote unquote normal actors. We had uh, people that had performance uh, skill. Others had acting experiences. Like we had the gamut of it. So it was trying to juggling what worked for every one of them. That was a, that was a bit of a thrill and a challenge. Yeah. When you guys got in there, you've got this you know group of characters. Which character demanded more camera time than you realized before you started? You mean camera time or prep time or? or I mean, like, like you started, you, like, you know, characters grow, they evolve, especially in a project like this where you're doing a lot of rewrites and everything. What character started to grow and demand more of the movie's time? Uh, interesting. Look, I mean, they were scripted. Uh, look, they, they all... We, we discovered things with all kinds of character. Like with David Roche, we discovered I mean, crazy things that he could pull off if given the right, like if after doing it, doing it, like rehearsing it, like a, like an improv session. And then he would like right. let loose and get in touch with his inner monster. And so we, he was able, he was able to add dialogue and add verboseness to his performance. That worked. With some, we realized that l less words worked m as well or, or had very powerful impact like um well allison allison Mitstoke, who plays maggie she she was written to be an anthropologist a scholar like a university doctoral student when we cast her we realized that she was a model she had played in small films uh in new york and i was like all right well i'll make her character a model you know i'll mirror the character on her and and so her it was more she you know even offset she dressed really well she was very classy, and, and, and I was like, okay, well, bring your clothes. She's like, she's sexy. You like dressing up in sexy clothes? Well, we're going to dress you up in sexy clothes. That's your character. Nice color. So the, the wardrobe people had a, had a blast with her. And, and so there you are of, with your shirt off, cracking jokes. No, well, yeah, no, his shirt off was with the guys. But um, so she, she um, her persona demanded a different kind of treatment. Um, yeah, I think that was... I think no character. I mean, yeah, some have more screen time, maybe because of dialogue. But I think when you see the whole thing, and you, you, because it, it starts out with a group of people, and when the, the therapist discovers that one of them is an imposter, like half of the people kind of like leave the workshop because they say like this is bullshit. But there's a few diehards that stay, and that becomes the core group. And these four end up all having their arcs and resolution, you know, like parallel to to one another. And I think they have pretty much almost the same amount of screen time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Good. I mean, that, that's a great answer because you know movies evolve and everything. I'm also so I've been I read a book about Michael Landon and him his artistry as a director because I was curious about how he approached things, and over the course of his long directorial life, he had certain tools, certain mechanisms, close ups on hands to you know create emotions and transitions and all these kind of things. You've worked in the commercial world a lot. How has that impacted how you direct things? And then like a commercial, I would think it's a different setting on your production perfection dial. Where does, where does your dial go when you're doing a movie in terms of production versus perfection? Oh, everything goes out to the shitter when I do a movie because to tell you the truth, I co-produced them. They're yeah. underfunded yeah. because they're weird little stories that, you know, that are kind of like, uh and so honestly um it's true in commercials you'll you'll do take a day to do 30 seconds for huge amounts of money and you'll redo something 20 times in my films it's it's weird i, I think i have a an allergic reaction i do the exact opposite I'll be like, yeah, let's do something. It's going to be like almost like super improv, loosey-goosey, no shot list, no storyboards. My crew, my DP is going to be like, uh, what the hell? You know, because yeah. I've been co-writing, co-producing, directing, casting. So I wear too many hats. And and, and then I, I forget to do my main, most important job, which is directing and mise-en-scene, mm. which is a mistake I won't do again. I'll promise you that. And so, yeah, oddly enough... Um, no, I, it's it's really not the same part of the brain. Like seriously, like I, I mean the yeah, 
the, it's more the inverse. The commercials I do, the ones that I'm good at, they're known for humor and characters that are a bit over the top. And it goes into like a little bit of crazy stuff and far fetch, and there's crescendos. And that you see in my films. So it's more that's my style. But I don't think the rigor of commercials I bring to the films because I don't have the time and the budget to do it. You know, yeah, like yeah. you end up with a, a diverse group of actors, some with no experiences, who are scared, some with experience on a tight budget, shooting at night in a hospital, some with speech impediments, and you got like eight pages of dialogue, and it talks about cancer and death. So you got to shoot like crazy, and you got to figure it out and make it work. Like like the, the whole like minutia of commercial goes out the window. You just rehearse it a bunch of times, and you see what <laughs> sticks, and you try to get the pieces. You're like, yeah, go, go, go. We got to yeah. clear by 6 a.m., you know? So more often than not, it's that, which is sad, which the film suffers from that, but... No, my main focus in the film was to get the magic, get the the tone right, mm -hmm. the continuity of tone and the continuity of emotional kind of, yeah. like I guess I keep using the word magic, but there's no other word I have, like the kind of intensity of it. Yeah, you my main, yeah. yeah. yeah you, you know when there's a magic moment and you're trying to capture as many of those as you can. You have to make compromises, though, and you don't always get the quality of what you want. What yeah. what are those things that bug you? Where you're like, this bugs me, but there's nothing I can do about it because we don't have the budget or the time for it. I mean, is it continuity of shot quality? Is it audio? What are the things that you're like? I just can never. I'm never satisfied with this aspect of my of my shoots. Honestly, it's never audio because I make sure I have damn good audio because that's that's you can't you, you can't screw with audio. You have to right. get good audio. Uh, no, honestly, the thing that I would change would be my own preparation for mise-en-scene, for directing. Uh, the, the thing that I don't never have enough of is spending time with myself, storyboarding everything, and basically shooting the film on paper beforehand. That's really okay. the thing that, that's been lacking in my work so far. I think it's because also the work is too ambitious for the budget. I, I tend to kind of like, I'm a producer and I should know better, but then yet I throw caution to the wind. I'm like, all right, guys, we're still going to do it, you know? And so, uh, yeah. Is so, that a skill you need to master, though? Like, do you need to shrink your vision down and edit what you're doing so that you fit within that budget and you can nail that mark better? Or do you just like, damn, forget it. We always make it work. No, uh, I think I need to. Uh, I think I need to. Uh, excuse me, Louis. I'm in an interview. Oh, I think I need to. Sorry. Uh, I, I think I need to um, master. By preparation, I think uh, we're doing, because we're doing some construction work in the house, that's why. Uh, yeah. I think with um, I think with more preparation and focus, I'll be able to refine what I want to say and how I want to say it. Because yeah. with less preparation, you tend to keep your options open, and, and then you go in all kinds of different directions. So I think by I'll be able to narrow the vision down if I spend more time eliminating the wrong directions to pick one. I don't know if that makes sense in preparation. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I want to make sure I mention the movie's called Happy Face. It's on Amazon. It's just a couple of bucks. Seriously, you guys, come on. Indie films, you got to support them. Listen to the passion in Alex's work, and you're going to see this on the screen. I have not watched the full movie yet, Alex, but I have watched a lot of it, and I just have to get back to watch it. I ran out of time. Sure. So sure. uh, watch it with me, and let's talk about it. And then, as always, everybody, please rate the film. I mean, this is what makes Alex's next project a lot easier to get off the ground so please support him on amazon all right now that i said that i wanted to ask again same kind of questions where you're a producer you're a director every time you do a movie maybe hopefully you're getting a little bit more money and you're getting i like to say if you're, if you're gathering heads for all of the hats that you have you can start taking hats off of your head and go here you're wearing the director photography hat here you're wearing you know the gaffer hat because you know you have to wear all of them so which hat would you love to grow to get rid of? Like, what's the next big hat? You're like, I can't wait to get this one off my head and onto somebody else's. So I can storyboard more. I mean, look, uh, I, I want to say, I mean, I, I wear the, co the producing, the writer hat, the director's hat. I don't wear the gaffer, the cinematographer hat. No, we get pros for this. It's not, you know, it's not like that small budget. But yeah. um, I think it would be the producing hat, really, because as much as I love the creative aspects of producing. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's, it's, a, it's a professional job. It's a skill set. And it, it's very demanding and, and time consuming. And so um, 
I would love to shed that hat, and that's my 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 uh, resolution for my next films is to find producers, skilled producers, producers that are more skilled than I am for all of my projects. As right. for the writer's hat, I've always written my stories because I guess that's the auteur thing we do when we're French. But eventually, I've, I've started seeing stories from writers, friend writers, or novelists that I really love and that I'd love to take a crack at without having written it. Just, for, just I think it would be liberating for me not to have like a story that's my baby, that that yeah. delves with my childhood or my angst or my fears or my 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 wounds. You know, it'd be just like something not autobiographical where I could just be like, "All right, this is my take on this." I haven't done that. I mean, I I don't do. I haven't done TV. I haven't done movies of the week or episodic. So uh, no, just my own films and the commercials pay the bills in the meantime. You know. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, in, in the podcast production world, it's the same thing. Like, I'm desperate to get rid of some of these hats, you know, like sure, YouTube sure. SEO specialist, you know. Like, <laughs> oh, my God, please, can someone else do this for me? But there are things you have to do to show to that next level of producer, that next check writer, that, like, I get these things done. And yeah. uh, it's, it's a battle that we always have to fight because there are projects I would love to go out and do that would be incredible, but I got to find the money to do it. To find the money, I got to go make commercials in your case or whatever it is yeah yeah, we have to hustle yes exactly 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 so okay happy faces out and you got it on amazon so you got a chance to make a little bit of money there you get the movie sold that's always a good sign exactly amazon youtube itunes i think all these yeah. all these providers it all, yeah, it's commonly available which is a which is a to anybody outside, this is a pretty significant step because you've got to get it available. But then you also got to build an audience for your work and, and get the thing sold. So like today here, we're talking here. But what aspect of the selling of your movie do you want to try to improve? Because if there's no money, there ain't no next movie, right? So how do you how do you get over the hump in terms of finding the next check or getting movies to, to light off and, and have enough of a successful run that the next check is easier to get to? Yeah, I mean, look, we're blessed and we're cursed in Canada because we've got state funding for films. So we all compete, we all apply, and then films get funded based on the merit of the screenplay, but also based on certain demographics or, you know, uh, uh, depending on the topics or the what kind of what who do you want to push you know so so it's it's a game in itself it's the, the game of culture state finance culture which is amazing because it allows us to sometimes have some freedom to do cool stuff stuff that's yeah. not market driven um the problem with that is we don't think of audience as much as our southern neighbors you guys we don't think of hustling on social media to get our audience out it's a generational thing too you know i'm in my 40s so yeah. yeah, you know, I grew up with, I didn't grow up with the internet, you know, so right. uh, yeah, I do it a little bit, but I'm not super skilled at it. Um, so I think for me, for me, it's going to make sure it's good. It's going to be making sure that my projects, I, like I said, I prep more, I focus more and that some of them are small enough that I could do with a minimal cast and crew, minimal budget. Even if I have to go back to doing a short film, like a, that's a proof of concept or uh, a particular story, standalone story. Um, and I think with Happy Face and the Wild Hunt, my first feature, I have enough of a track record to be able to knock on doors. Right. To be able to, to say, hello, I've got this thing. It won't be like, oh my God, <laughs> yeah, sure, let's go. But it'll <laughs> yeah. be, all right, let's take a look at your synopsis. Let's take a look at your one page. Let's take a look at your log line, at your little pitch book, and then we'll get back to you. So I have enough of a track record to do that. And yeah. for me, that's that's enough to work with, you know? And you're, you're I mean, to your credit, you are way far down the road in terms of what it takes to get to there. I mean, you know, what it, like, if it's, this is like, I'd like to do a short, that guy is so far back in the learning process. You're way up here when you're worried about these things. You're not worried about if you can put a movie in the can. You're not worried about getting audio right. You've got those. You know what those things are. You know how long a movie takes you to make, you know, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is a substantial a substantial advantage over someone who's just getting started. But um, I although, guess what, although, what's the... Although, sorry, although I, I, I've noticed like young people today with the internet and, and the, the technology and the cameras, they, they really... I mean, they're fast learners. They, 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 you know, read all about it, 
check out the videos, yeah. hang out with their friends, and they do stuff that gets into big festivals, you know, that gets around. And so, you know, it's not like you had 35 millimeter prints back in the day with the big cameras and the print, <laughs> and it cost a yeah. fortune to get it developed. So, um, yeah, 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 I guess I'm a step ahead, I suppose. But as a filmmaker, we never see that. We always think we're a step behind. So, <laughs> yeah, well, and you are. You are even even as you're a step ahead, you're also a step behind at all times, right? Exactly. The uh, the show, the podcast version of the show that's coming out today, are two very young uh, movie makers, and it's as if they've never had a difficult moment in their life. And I'm not knocking them. They're like, yeah, we started talking, and we thought we would make a full feature movie. You know, and we took these classes in college, and so we knew how to do it. And I'd never produced a movie before, but you know, Nicholas told me how to do it, and so I went out and did it. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, you know, like out of the mouth of babes. So it's doable, but man, it is, it is like you said, you always got one foot behind you. I, I want to stop there. I want to come back. To, I want to ask you about audience, yeah, because Calgary. Vancouver, Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, all wildly different places. I mean, Canada from, from down south, our view is it's almost two countries, and you guys vote on this fairly regularly. Are you two countries or one country? How does that impact your filmmaking? I mean, not in terms of finance, but in terms of like audience when you consider it. Um, so sorry, ER was texting me, so we'll have to do something with ER some other time because his, his internet is bad. But yeah. Um, yeah. Honestly, it's two worlds in, in cinema. Like, for instance, my film got distributed in Quebec, yeah. in the U.S., Yeah. but somehow it did not show in English Canada. And so... Yeah. Uh, I, what honestly, do you make of that? I think it's bullshit, but uh, I make of it that it maybe it wasn't successful enough or didn't hit a buzz enough at the big international festivals so that English Canada would then look at them. If you make a buzz at, um, well, TIFF, which is Toronto, but like the big festivals around the world, the English Canada will look at it. But as for Quebec, I mean, it depends. Honestly, it depends on the topic, the subject matter, uh, the quality of the film. I mean, Happy Face is by no means a perfect film. It's a, it's a flawed film about flawed people by a flawed director. I mean, but it's great fun to watch. You know, it's yeah. a, an audience member in LA once, we were doing a test screening at the end said, um, not a test screening, it was a festival. The audience member says, this is like the breakfast club meets freaks. Ah. And I was like, yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. It was kind of like, yeah. so honestly, yeah, the, the no, no, Canada is two solitudes, as they used to say, certainly culturally in terms of films. Uh, and, and mind you, I, I, I lived in Vancouver and Toronto. I studied film in those cities. I have friends in those cities. Um, but it's a completely different thing. I think the English film industry, the Canadian English film industry, is very, very much turned towards the U.S. Mm. You know, yeah. whereas in Quebec, we're turned towards the U.S., we're turned towards Europe, we're turned towards ourselves because we're an island of French people in the sea of Anglophones. And so um, I think that's what makes for its effervescent, you know, effervescence creatively. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, cracking English Canada, like the saying goes, like the tacit saying goes, you don't try to crack the market in English Canada. You, you go for the States and then, then if you, you know, you, you're never a prophet in your own country. You know, you go for the States, and if you get a buzz there, all of a sudden Preach they'll it. talk about you. Preach it. Yes. That's it. Amen. Yeah, that is absolutely yeah, – yeah, yeah. How about how about in your hometown? Are you, uh, are you a hit there, or do you have to beg people to know that you actually do this for a living? No, I've, no, I'm not a hit. Uh, <laughs> look, I, I'm not a hit, but I, I'm not unknown. The sense is, you have to understand, I'm French, but I have a French accent. J'ai un accent de Paris. I have a, a French-Parisian accent because my family immigrated from France. And Quebec, yeah. it's, it's a French-Canadian. So it's like, let's say you're in Texas and you got a, you got a guy with a British accent. Yeah. So culturally, I'm a, I'm a bit between two countries. And I grew up in an English part of town. So uh, my films were always in English. And, and I'm in the French province, so I'm not helping myself with the market here. And right. I make it about cancer and disfigurement. So, but my movie has been heard, like all the producers in town have heard of the movie and they've heard great things about it, but they haven't seen it. And I say, they're great. <laughs> if you heard great things and, and, and you smile when I call you and you take my calls and you haven't seen the movie, I'm like, perfect. So, so no, I guess I, I have um, I have access to, to the film industry. I am part of that. Um, 
but I'm not, it's not like I'm walking down the street and people are recognizing like Denis Villeneuve or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. no, you're not, not there. <laughs> these are these are funny things though. I mean, uh, on the podcast side, and I'm not trying to equate us 100%, but you know, one of the hurdles that we have to get over on the podcast side is like, is this legitimate? Are you just some kind of guy in your garage, you know, and everything? And I'm like, no, motherfucker, I do this for a living. Like, I make a living doing this. And it's funny when you have to convince someone, they're like, oh, I thought you were messing around. Like, <laughs> yeah. And you're, and you're like, they're like, they're like, oh, yeah, I know Joe Rogan. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're like, all right, that's a podcast, you know? And it's like, same thing. It's like Joe Rogan, the movie Love, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Oh, it's so funny. Hey, what are you working on now? What's coming up for you movie-wise? Well, two things, actually. Uh, the, the most advanced one is called The Other, L'Autre. It's in French. It's okay. the sequel to Happy Face. It's actually the same character 20 years later. And it's basically my story with cancer. I had cancer 10 years ago. And... Um, in the leg, in the bone, and they put me in a room, in a hospital room, uh, next to a guy that had been shot by street gangs in both of his legs. So there were two of us on morphine, barely conscious, both our legs, you know, both of us had our legs screwed up. And after a couple of days, I started realizing that the doctors and nurses were mistaking him for me, giving him the wrong medication, giving me the wrong medication, calling us by the wrong names. And I realized that the bed numbers were inverted in the computer system because of some glitch and that he had been moved to my room because he was fearing for his life in another room that he was in because there were some people wounded there that were linked to the gangs that shot him and I started it dawned on me like I got to get out of here because if not they're going to come and finish him off and they're going to mistake me for him and I'm going to get shot or something and in my morphine delirium I started really really panicking and trying to get out of bed and do my physio and Anyway, my life was going like downhill, and but that that situation like jumpstart me and being like, okay, I gotta I gotta get the fuck out of there. So it's a psychological thriller taking place in a hospital room based on that anecdote, which is brutal. This is, this is fantastic. I love it. I love it. So, so so that's the sequel to this one. Kind of. I mean, it's it's it's. I call it the second part of my cancer trilogy, which is not a very marketing marketable term, but that's what I call it. Yeah, nice log line. Yeah. And then uh, is there a third one then? Like, and then you die or something? And it's like people looking back at your life? Or what's the third No, one? no. The third one is kind of a how-to manual for young boys on, on how to become a man, uh, you know, and not being a jerk. I mean, it's available for girls. It's going to be a weird – I mean, it's embryonic. It's going to be a mix of a documentary and fiction, but it's not – that's, like, far off in the – in the future. No, the other movie I'm working on, I'm developing it, I, I, I had some money to write it, is, is a action horror film called One Flesh. I like it. I yeah, like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Action horror. And do you yeah, like yeah. horror as a genre then? Is that like a sweet spot? Uh, yeah, but I'm not a big uh, connoisseur, connoisseur okay. of horror. I, no, I like, I like the grotesque. I like, I like the psychological horror i like the dark parts of the human soul it doesn't mean it has to be gore it's it's the type of thing that's close to reality and, and you're kind of like oh my god with dread you know yeah. so i like films that are as close to reality as possible and then something really horrific happens and then it fills you with dread that in that sense i like uh, it yeah 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 like the really the, like the, the french version of grotesque you know like more like that definition of the word as opposed to like the american english version of it Probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I've had you for about an hour. I'd love to, you, do you want to ask me any questions or should we just wrap this thing up? Uh, well, just tell me about the podcast a little bit. I break it down. It's, I was like, uh, yeah, it's uh well, so I was a combat spy and I was combat, combat spy. I was in Iraq, Afghanistan, that kind of thing. And I would go outside the wire and talk to the locals every day. And so really? I took the same kind of model and applied it to the show where I'm trying to find these bits of gold out. And then and you can probably tell my questions are different. I don't, I mean, the movie's there, but I want people to go see the movie, right? So I don't ask specifically about that. I'm asking more about you, about your process. And I'm looking for things to, to explore with you. So it's uh, it's it's been a real success. I mean, we're continuing to grow. I mean, I, it's ridiculous when I look at all the people that have been on the show, wonderful people like you, super famous people, people that no one would even heard of, but are fascinating. And it's just been, it's been the blessing of my whole life, except for my daughter. I love her the more, but um, it, it's, a, it's an emotional experience and a ride that I get to share these great conversations with people. 
Ah, interesting. I mean, it's funny because the hero of, um, I mean, it's not related to being a combat spy, but the hero of One Flesh is a, is a veteran. Is a, I mean, in my story, is a, an army veteran that did tours in Iraq. It's a woman. And so I'm looking, I'm starting to look at doing some research and talking to people uh, south of the border about that. Huh, yeah. Well, let me know. Glad to help. Yeah, Glad yeah, to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Always curious to get to get the real the real uh, straight from the horse's mouth. Sure. Yeah. No one's been outside the fire more than me. I mean, I've been out a whole bunch, so I can tell you what that's all about. Oh, but do you, you speak uh, Arabic? No, no, no. But I'm a master at at um, working with interpreters, so I have pretty good comprehension of Arabic. I mean, I speak a little French, I speak a little German, all that kind of stuff, but. Not, I'm not a master in any one of them, but I'm really good at connecting with someone else and saying, hey, let's go let's go see these French people. And then I'm going to shut up and let you be French. And I'm not going to try to be French. I'm going to be me and be honest. And, and we work together as a three-person conversation to get where I'm going. No, I see. I see. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, I, I, I can't imagine in, in Iraq being a, going out of the, I guess, the, 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 the secure zones, I guess, I suppose it was. it was. Yeah, yeah. You leave the secure zone and the go the out into zone town. And yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Which, which but, is but tricky. because It is yeah. tricky. And a lot of time, most of the time, we have our own portable secure zone. Like we go out with vehicles and guns, that kind of thing. And so I'm working within this protection bubble for the most part. But I'm still also trying to get away from those guys so I can say, let's talk. Let's talk to you and I off the record. And I'm looking for people that want to have conversations. So that's that's ultimately what I do, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's far <laughs> out. No, because, you know, we, we keep thinking, like, I'm thinking, okay, is the guy going to pose as a tourist in Iraq in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of the zone? Yeah. That doesn't work, you know. I, the, I don't pose as anything. I just pose as me. I'm just no, there to no. talk, ask questions. I let them know exactly why I'm there. I'm here to find things out. You know, yeah, yeah. don't talk to me if you don't want to, but I'm fun to talk to. Let's have drinks. You know how many times in Iraq during Ramadan I've had shots, you know, where they're like, hey, do you want some drinks? And of course, you always say yes to that. Like, yeah, I want drinks. And of the course. next thing you know, you're having this. You're not even getting drunk. You're just having a conversation because you or two guys just had drinks and that works anywhere in the world. And so I just let them be them and I adapt to where they're at. And they, they tell me things because I'm not a jerk. It's yeah. funny, you know, I hear you. I, um, I lived in Dubai, in the Persian Gulf in the late 90s, 96, 98. And um, I mean, Dubai is pretty safe and secure. And it's like a big shopping mall. But there were a lot of people from, I mean, from Iran and from Afghanistan, too, and, and Taliban, too, there. And uh, I remember I spoke a few words of Arabic and just going to the market, trying to buy carpets and just hanging out with those guys. And because I loved the Arabic culture, I had read books and, you know, and... I love the art and the poetry of it, and um, and I was just curious. And and I remember, yeah, the, the interactions and having a drink or sitting down and just taking the time. I mean, it's, it's the culture too, right? Um, yeah. Which we don't have up in the west or in the north. You know, we're more fast paced. And um, I remember during Ramadan, at one point, a colleague of mine, Arabic, he goes, "Do you want to go to the Coca Cola factory?" I go, what's that? He goes, yeah, come. And we, we were in Sharjah, a, a, a suburb of Dubai. And uh, that's where I was, I was teaching, actually. I was in banking. And um, we, we go to this kind of old wall of this old fort. And I see guys like in their bias or dish dash, like locals, you know, like carrying out bags of stuff into their, like, into their Range Rovers and souped up SUVs. And we go there and basically you buy booze, you know, you just buy booze, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it was just like the big traffic and during Ramadan, it was like the big party. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's true. And then one of the things when you use culture to your advantage, I ask you a question about the English and French Canadian divide and you can't help, but tell me about it because it's, it's such a powerful cultural thing for you guys. And so I, I now can get in, you're doing all the talking and then I'm just, I'm not trying to control. I'm just looking like for light, light, like direction. Where do I want you to go with that? And, th and that's the trick to all of this spy stuff is just to find those things. Look, everybody loves their kids. Everybody did hates you, cancer. You, sorry. Did you learn that? Did you learn that or you developed it through experience? I, we actually I, learned that there's a manual for that. Yeah, no, I learned that through experience. I mean, are there books out there that talk about it? Sure. Did it stick in my head? No, you know, but, but I went out and I, I learned because one of the things that we do in the, on the American side of things 
the U.S. side of things, is we we try to out Iraq and Iraqi. Like, don't ever use this symbol. Don't ever eat or drink during Ramadan. And so I'll ask him, and I'm like, hey, do you mind if I have a drink during Ramadan? And the guy will be like, why would I care if you drink? You're not an Islamic guy. You know, like you're an American. You can drink all the water you want. You're not going to make me mad. It's my job to do Ramadan, not yours. You know, and then you're like, huh, what else should I know about Ramadan? How about that there's a bottle of booze in my desk right now? Would you like some? I mean, literally, that's a conversation I have with the guy. And because I didn't try to be like so stoic and, and like I must suffer through Ramadan with you, they allow me to be me and then they get to be them. And that's that's where the magic happens for me. When I hear them being them, I shut up and I just try to understand where they're at and and understand how they put their thoughts together, you know, their goals and how they make decisions. Yeah, yeah, you don't, I, I hear you, you don't, um, because then you become two humans talking about the thing and you're on equal terms in a weird way. You, you're both talking about Ramadan. You're not trying to act as the Western guy who's super stoic and, and manages Islamic sensitivities. You're more talking as a human being. It's like, uh, am I okay if I drink? You're cool with that? You're good? And yeah. it's like, yeah, sure. You know, you there's a distance and, and then, yeah, you connect. Right, yeah. right. And then also don't know more than that guy about their own culture, even if you do. You shut the fuck up and let that person be an expert. And if they disagree with you, that's an important cultural thing where like this person has a different reality culturally than I've learned in the book. You know, and I'll give you an exact example of this. In Iraq, there was a place, there's a nuclear power plant that the Israelis blew up. Everybody knows this in the whole world, except for the people right there. Right there, the Iranians blew it up. And he'd be like, no, 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 the Israelis blew it up. I learned to shut up, and I'm like, let me shut up. The Iranians blew this up. When? How? What was it? And they had a completely alternate reality that if I didn't allow them to be smart and know their own area, I would never have found that out. And so I would report that back to the commanders, and they would be like, no, the Israelis blew that up. You're stupid. And I'm like, I'm not stupid. This is what these people think. This is the Iranian influence. And then they started to put it together and go, wow, we're really talking about a different world. I had, they had no idea on how to think through these things. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, completely, completely. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I don't want to keep you any longer. I need to go finish watching your movie, but I really appreciate you coming on. Express my uh, my my desire to have ER back on the show. I'll we'll text him right it now, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. No, it was really good for me, too. And uh, I think I have your email, so I'll keep in touch. Please, yeah, and, please uh, do. Yeah, I'll follow your podcast. I'll check it out. I love that. Okay, stand by one sec. Let me roll this video. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching the Break It Down Show.